Okay, good afternoon. It's been a good first day at the ITAKE Unconference. Thanks for hanging in for the uh, last talk of the day. Um, seen a lot of great stuff today myself, so really appreciate the organizers uh, having me here, and um, it's been great to visit uh, Bucharest as well. So today, uh, going to be talking about, obviously, kind of these abstract, non-Cody things like aesthetics and narrative, but we're going to start out uh, with functional programming, of course. So a real quick digression on functional programming to make sure we're on the same page here. Uh, functional programming includes Lisp and Scheme and Clojure and Haskell, and they share some of these um, some of these similarities uh, that really define it as functional programming. One, most of them use a REPL, a read, eval, print loop, which allows for interactive programming. Um, they're based around symbolic expressions, which are uh, essentially representations of binary trees, and that's how you get that prefix notation with all those great parentheses that you see in functional programs. Um, they're inherently composable, uh, they inherently have uh, higher order functions that are composable, meaning that you can pass a function to a function. And the functions within functional programming languages are pure, meaning that they are free from side effects. And so you put information in, it's operated on, and then information comes out. And that feature makes functional programming really great when you're trying to reason about code, when you're trying to think uh, how your software is working, specifically because um, it's, it's quantitatively analyzable. And so like within the domains of finance, within the domains of processing data, it's easy to see this one function without any third vector coming in. There's no other um, information coming in to pollute the function. It's easy to see and think about what that function's doing because it's one function doing one job. And as you look at that function, you can analyze it for, for example, correctness, or if it's performing well, if it's performing quickly or slowly. And you can do that mathematically, of course. So you can get absolute quantitative results. And then with that information, uh, with that analysis, then it's easy to also think about or cogitate about the behavior and think about improvements. So those are the advantages out of the box of functional programs. But functional, um, functional programming also has a long history, not just in quantitative domains, but also has a long history in abstract domains that include aesthetics and story. The one final thing uh, before we move on uh, that I want to make sure we're on the same page about uh, is art, which is not an easy task necessarily. Uh, because everybody in here, including myself, has come in uh, with your preconceived notions of art. And uh, if we're going to talk about these abstract domains and how functional programs have worked in this domain, I think we need a baseline agreement here. So um, my definition of art comes from this idea that uh, anything utilitarian is a tool. And then once you extend that utilitarian's um, featureless to have something aesthetic, to have something non-utilitarian or functional, uh, once you extend that, then you have a piece of art. So a hammer is a hammer until you carve some sort of thing into the handle, maybe a goddess, and then that hammer can be art, right? Because that, that crafting isn't part of the hammer's tool. For example, this Greek amphora here um, is a technology. These amphoras were uh, introduced or invented uh, to help shipping, to help ship liquids across the Mediterranean. Over time, they started decorating the amphoras, and they started using amphoras for ceremonial purposes. And to that degree, of course, you would not be surprised to see something like this in an art museum, even though it's technology, even though it's just technology. And this particular amphora was likely used um, for something other than shipping. It's probably, again, ceremonial. Uh, the shape isn't great for shipping, and the handles would probably break. 
But regardless, it's based out of a technology. We have these accoutrements that we add, and then they become art. Now, as an artist making these decisions, uh, when we paint the Sinfora or when we craft this uh, hammer handle, um, there are two ways an artist can really operate here. One way is through a process of chaos and surrender. You're familiar with the painter Jackson Pollock, for example. He's the guy that dripped a bunch of paint on canvas and hung it up, and that was art, right? And uh, he just, he didn't really have any, he wasn't trying to get that specific paint at that specific place. He yielded to the randomness of the universe and allow that, and allowed that to um, essentially form his paintings. Most artists, though, work with a lot more decisiveness, with a lot more agency in how they actually go about crafting what they're doing. And so that would be the other end of the spectrum here. So that's why the decisive artist has to know the rules. This is a saying my mother used to tell me. She's an artist. Um, that's why an artist has to know the rules before they can break them. Uh, otherwise, it's just random. And a lot of people think of art as something that you go into an art museum, you maybe, my, my kid could make that, you know? Or what are the rules that make, what makes this good art and this bad art? Well, you still, there are still contexts and rules that are applied that made this painting or this sculpture worthy or something that should be in an art museum, right? Those are the rules that these artists are breaking. Now, a programmer, similarly, um, has to know the rules before they can write them. And they suffer the, the, the same thing that an artist suffers from, and that's the fact that we don't always know the rules, even as programmers. And this is one of the things about functional programming that people enjoy so much. That REPL, for example, at the very beginning, that interactive programming where you can type a command in to the REPL, and you can type a piece of code in, and it immediately gives you a response, a simple function. So to illustrate sort of that difference in this, um, in this, uh, this tendency towards functional programming in these domains that are very exploratory, I'm going to start with uh, an artist named Harold Cohen. And um, he created a, a machine with a pretty long development cycle, 1968 into the 21st century. It's a, it's a, maybe not an agile development cycle right there. Not a short sprint, at least. And he started it in Fortran. Eventually, he had to convert it to C. And eventually, he ended up in Lisp. And we'll talk about why that is. So uh, this is Aaron's output in 1983. Um, so to, to be clear, this is a piece of paper with uh, paint on it. So Aaron is a robot that paints. This is his output in 1992. And obviously, there's a huge, uh, a significant difference. One is, of course, that it's representative. You can see that it's, you know, it's a human form. And um, two is color. Uh, color is the one thing I want to focus on here, because that's the thing that eventually brought him to Lisp. That's the thing that made him think, you know, C isn't the right language for this job. And I need a language that is um, more able and more capable to handle these abstract domains. So he's trying to solve a problem. His problem is color. Now, color is pretty abstract, I would say, meaning that um, when you think about blue, you know, what's bluer, how do you get a bluer blue? I mean, what is bluer blue? How do you quantify blue? Is this bluer blue than this blue, right? It's hard to say what exactly constitutes blue versus red. Right? We know it when we see it. And we as humans also know, of course, that when we combine blue and yellow, we have green. And when he started working on Aaron, he started thinking about these colors. When he started working in colors on Aaron, he started thinking about them in a way of, well, I'll just define the universe of color. I'll define um, all of these attributes of color. And then Aaron will be able to use color. But what he found was, actually, Aaron, um, Aaron wasn't able to work that way because he couldn't define all of the attributes of color. There were just too many. And so what Aaron ended up doing, uh, what he ended up doing when he moved to Lisp, what Aaron ended up, how it ended up working, was he would have small uh, bits of 
of color information in small functions, and then he would compose them together depending on the context. Okay, so Aaron would have some sort of contextual decision to make, and then because of the, the rules or the parameters, I guess, of that, of that decision, uh, Aaron would decide to put a couple functions together that made sense, and that, for example, would give him the correct skin tone, right? A human skin tone instead of green or something like that. And the way that Aaron worked through these problems is still different than the way that artists work through the problems. The way that Aaron worked through the problems is maybe a little bit more like how Data on Star Trek might work through a problem. Aaron considered all the possibilities and then made a decision, kind of like how Deep Blue uh, won in chess. Basically, brute force, consider all the possibilities, making a decision. Uh, now, the one important thing is that it would be impossible to consider every single possibility for a color before making a decision, so there had to be some way of limiting it, limiting it, and we'll get to that in a second. But that's Aaron's process. It's different than the process an artist makes. Often an artist is more like a functional programmer where an artist will pick a color or make a decision, manifest that intent on a canvas or in a sculpture, and then consider the repercussions of that intent. Was that the right color? Uh, I need to add more yellow, or I need to make some change in the form to make this work. And so we know that we're intelligent and creative, and we question then when we see Aaron, you know, maybe Aaron passes a Turing test of some sort, maybe Aaron is intelligent, maybe Aaron's creative. But that's really not what Harold Cohen was going after. What Cohen was going after was this idea of autonomy that's going to be an important thread through this uh, talk. Um, this is the one quote I'll read. I think it's good for Cohen to talk about this in his own words. He said, I want to make it clear that I'm in trying to model cognitive behavior in a computer program. I was not a cognitive science scientist doing research. I was an artist attempting to give form to what my own cognitive experience had told me. He's trying to give form to what his experience had told him. And so Aaron created paintings as essentially an assistant or an extension of Cohen. Cohen died last year, though. And he often joked when he was alive that he would be the first artist with a posthumous exhibition of new work. Not like Tupac or Prince that has new records, releases, new, new records released after they die. No, Aaron continues to paint to this day. Um, even without Cohen's involvement. So another uh, example to illustrate how this functional programming sort of uh, way of working has been important in these domains, in abstract domains, is the game Zork. Anybody remember the game Zork? A few people? Fewer than I thought. Wow. Uh, Zork was a text adventure game. Uh, another significant development window here, 1975 to 1982. Uh, it started off as Colossal Cave Adventure, and then when it landed at MIT, those programmers uh, extended Colossal Cave Adventure and changed it and created a new game called Zork. It started in Fortran, just like Cohen, but then it went into Muddle, which is essentially Lisp, uh, MIT design language. It's essentially a dialect of Lisp with types. Um, and then to Zill, which is their own Zork implementation language that they eventually built to port it to PCs like the Apple II, the Commodore 64, that sort of thing. So what Zork looked like, not so compelling, but when you played it, it was a lot of fun. Uh, it had, usually had some description, and then you typed in some, um, some action for it to do, open the mailbox, you take the letter, read the letter, welcome to Zork. Okay, that's the sort of, um, that's the sort of interaction that you'd get. And the original Colossal Cave Adventure in 75 had a very simple verb noun command set so that you could say, go west, open mailbox, that sort of thing. But that's not really how we talk, and that's not a very good experience. And so when the MIT uh, designers got involved and created Zork, they added the ability to handle prepositions, objects, prepositions, prepositions and conjunctions, uh, objects that are both direct or indirect, so they might, you might type in, fill the bottle with water, and you have a much more natural experience with um, the software. Here's some Zill code. And you can see that this is a lantern that we're dealing with in this particular uh, uh, part of the implementation, where its location is, uh, how it's described, its brass, some synonyms, 
And the thing that's important about this particular snippet of code is that while this looks like metadata, this is metadata that is about the lantern, because it's Lisp, it's executable code. Right? So you can actually compose these things together. So you don't have to define everything a lantern can do possible in the universe. What matters is, is you can define simple things about a lantern and then compose functions together to get complex behaviors. Right? Same sort of thing, a small number of primitives. And so through that, you have this feeling of autonomy that you're working with hand-in-hand, -hand, a narrative guide, and then you, using natural language, type and you talk with the guide, and they take you through the, they take you through the forest, they take you through the underground. This isn't just a technology phenomenon. This happens in all sort of complex art systems. Take making a movie. When you make a movie, you have a script. The script is a technical document. The script is formatted the same way a movie script was formatted in the typewriter era. The formatting means something. The margin width, the font choice, the font size, it actually means something to the producers and the people working with the script. And so these autonomous agents, just like the autonomous software, these autonomous agents are going to take that script and turn it into a movie. They're going to break it down, and they're going to decide what wardrobe needs to be there for what day. They're going to, camera people are going to break it down, and they're going to decide the shots. Directors are going to break it down. They're going to decide how the actors are going to implement the script. In fact, it's such a technical document that most people in this room have never probably read a script, but you might have read, for example, a novelization. So Star Wars has been novelized, right? And a lot of people read the novels. Very few people get the actual original technical document on which that was based. And in fact, the people that are writing the novels are almost never the people that wrote the screenplay because it's a technical document. And so the important thing about the script, though, is not the script itself. That's why we don't read scripts. It's the execution of the script. That is the movie. And when you work with a runtime language, when you work with a language that, um, that actually has autonomous features, or when you work with uh, software that has autonomous features, uh, it goes beyond just, uh, it goes beyond uh, in execution the original intent because you can't predict every possible outcome of this code. Now, that's not to say that there aren't quantitative acts of creativity. For example, um, this uh, art piece, Every Icon, by John Simon. Uh, this was created in 1997. Well, that's when it started. And it's a quantitative piece, meaning that this will eventually end when every score is black. And the whole goal, or the whole execution, I should say, of this art piece and is an execution where every single icon that could be possibly made in a 32 by 32 square is actually made on this. It's generated over time. So it's still running today. It's a Java applet that you can look at in your browser. Um, it'll take uh, several hundreds of trillions of years to finish. Um, so we'll never see the end. We'll never see the black square. But it does have an end. And it does have a quantitative objection, uh, objective, unlike Harold Cohen's uh, Aaron software. Or Super Mario Brothers. Super Mario Brothers is, I would argue, a quantitative game if you've ever played level 1-1, one, one, and you're running right here, and that Goomba is going to come down the same way that that Goomba always comes down, right? There's never a change in the software. The software is always running procedurally, not autonomously, but procedurally. So within thinking about these things from the programmer side, or the artist side, or the creator side, you have to have strategies for qualitative reasoning. And they're difficult strategies to develop because you're dealing with unknown quantities. And your goal isn't necessarily the quantifiable end, like the quantifiable end of every icon. Your goal is usually an exploration of an idea. And that's where the computer and you work together. So um, before wrapping up, I want to uh, talk about a contemporary piece, which is a piece I'm working on called Borderless and how these quantitative strategies uh, might be, uh, or qualitative strategies might be applied. So Borderless is an art installation uh, that runs uh, a piece of software called Overtone. It's a, it's a library 
that plugs into Clojure. And uh, I have that working with a connect that makes the installation, of course, interactive. The visuals are very abstract. You're in an abstract domain. And the effect is when you walk into the room, you visually see uh, figures emerging from the walls or from curtains. Uh, they're actually shot in liquid, filmed in liquid, but they emerge from the liquid and go back down. That's half of the experience. The other half is the interactive experience or the reactive experience that then senses people in the room and changes the sonic landscape based on how people are um, positioned within one another's space or the space in the room in general. And the way that this works is essentially a set of transducers. And I'm just going to look at some actual like, code and some actual data just to give a sense of like, what we're dealing with here. So you have the input transducer side where you, talk, where you see if a person entered or if a person left or if a person changed some of, something about their position. The input includes how long they've been there, um, their ID number, what their center is, how tall they are in the rectangle, that sort of stuff. The output is, and this is the transducer part, the output, of course, is not that information. The output is sonic. And so the sonic information, are, or the sonic information is on the axes of sound, which includes timbre, loudness, and pitch. And so all of that information is transduced into sonic information on those axes that have technical names like uh, voltage-controlled amplifier, voltage-controlled oscillator, envelope, et cetera, et cetera. So the way that the transducer works then overall is you have the vision connect, uh, the vision from the connect is the input, the output is the overtone sound, and in the middle you have closure uh, operating on this information via a bunch of, via a few composable primitive uh, concepts. An operation might look like this in the transducer. Here we have a person entering, and then what closure does is add it to a set of people. And then if a person updates, meaning time occurs, which time is always occurring, might update the age, like how long they've been there, might update where they are. But regardless, as long as a person's there, it's updating. And so it finds that person within the set, and then it then modifies what we call vowel here. It modifies um, some attributes of that person. In this case, it's um, amplitude, the reverb, the pitch. And the thing is, is you're dealing with complexity. So this is a piece of the code, and it's not here to be understood. It's here to just show, like, well, I look at this, I look at this code, and it's an awful lot to just kind of react to, right? It's an awful lot to, to um, as a human, uh, change something and have some intention manifested and then observe the outcome, right? Because it's this big honking function. And so we have to have some way of qualitatively reasoning about this. And just dealing with this function isn't really the way to actually really grok the entire entirety of what your change uh, or how your change manifests. And so uh, we have to know the rules, we can break them. That's one of the axioms that we've already established. And the other axiom is constraints breed creativity. One of the problems with qualitative reasoning and software is that within software you can do anything. So there are no rules in software. It's just like the art world. You can make anything in software with very little cost besides time. And so um, I'm glad um, this morning's key keynote was on uh, specifications and executable specifications, because that's essentially what we're going to deal with as an artist. We have to have some way to create constraints. We have to have some way to find, uh, to find a world through which we can navigate. And Clojure has this ability out of the box. Uh, Clojure, the most current alpha version, uh, has this new addition called Spec, which is an integrated system for writing specifications and generating tests. And spec, as you might imagine, of course, is a functional aspect of closure. And so in this case, uh, uh, here's one constraint based on the rules of science. So um, frequency, for example. Uh, pitch for a human being is between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz. That's what we can hear. And so if I'm going to generate any information, because my installation is for humans, related to pitch, 
I'm going to want it within that domain. Right? So this is a specification. Uh, I can also create aesthetic constraints. Aesthetic constraints that I, as an artist, think of. This is what I'm conceiving as an artist that I'm going to manifest as a specification. And so uh, here we have specifications with reverb or pitch or amplitude that are then applied. And what we get then is something that we can work with the computer, we can work with the software. And instead of testing the software, that's what we usually think of it as, to test it to see if we get the right quantitative output, we're experimenting with it to see if we can get the right qualitative output based on specifications that we created within Clojure. And as uh, an artist, or as a person working within a qualitative domain, the advantage here is that now the computer and I work together, and it might lead me down uh, unexpected paths, it might give me unexpected results. Uh, it becomes an expressive tool that I work with that informs me of things that I didn't even think of. I'm a painter manifesting my intent on a canvas. I take a color and I put it on and then I react to that. That is my strength as a human, as an artist. That is a strength that a computer doesn't have right now. And so in this case, it's the same sort of thing. I am working with code and I've created some constraints. I've created a world for the code to live and for the code to grow and change things, and sometimes even change things uh, that I didn't even expect. And with Borderless specifically, Borderless uh, is installed in a room that might run for a month. And so Borderless will be running and modifying itself maybe all month long. And I do need Borderless to have some constraints for it to make those decisions. Um, I'd like to end on uh, just a little note on autonomy how it's related to uh, spec, or sorry, how it's related to borderless, how it's related to Aaron, and all of these autonomous agents that we've talked about within computer lang or within uh, computer software. And the going notion, as far as I can tell, in autonomy is is really the vision comes out of John McCarthy's vision of artificial intelligence. So John McCarthy, of course, is one of the founders of the, if not the founder of the discipline at MIT and then moving on to Stanford and worked in AI his entire adult life and also the inventor of Lisp. So he's had dramatic, dramatic ramifications on the world that we live in, especially as programmers. And so John McCarthy um, saw artificial intelligence as something, of course, a computer is doing something independent of the person. A computer is doing something that it is operating outside of what I'm doing, right? that is an artificial intelligence capable outside of myself. But there are other versions or other visions for the future of computing uh, besides that one. Another uh, vision was augmented intelligence. Uh, this is Doug Engelbart. Some of you might have seen uh, 1968's Mother of All Demos, uh, where he introduces the world uh, for the first time to the computer mouse, to the graphical user interface, to collaborative computing, basically uh, the cloud, <laughs> okay? Uh, he, that mother of all demos was basically an atomic explosion of innovation within our field of computer science. And his vision, working also actually near Stanford at SRI, his vision of augmented intelligence is not to say that the computer is completely autonomous, uh, sorry, not to, completely separate from the person, but the computer is integrated with the person and augments what we do and makes our job easier and makes finding out facts and it makes coming to conclusions easier. It works with us, not separate from us. It's not going to grow up and replace us, which is people's fear of, of course, artificial intelligence, the McCarthy style. And the thing that I like personally about this vision of autonomy in this vision of augmented intelligence, is that it recognizes the authorship of the original programmer. And for better or for worse, that exposes the original biases and the original intentions of that programmer. Like Harold Cohen talking about 
uh, talking about Aaron being an extension of uh, being a manifestation of his own cognitive processes. Software is an extension, is a result of our individual cognitive processes, right? So that's an important notion on autonomy that's sometimes left out of people's vision of artificial intelligence when it comes to self-driving cars, when it comes to predictive policing and this oncoming uh, machine age that we're entering into, where uh, these, these pieces of software are somehow considered objective, somehow considered uh, above mistake, even though they're imbued with the original sin of being created by a human being. And so therefore, is also included in that all the biases of that human being, facial recognition, things like that, where as we, as we go along, we start to see the biases coming out of the software. And when we think about things as just autonomous agents that are tied to the creator's intentions, like Harold Cohen, like software designers making qualitative decisions, then we can actually know something about the authorship of the software making these qualitative decisions and helping us through this world. Uh, my name is David Schmoody. I love talking about big ideas. I love talking about functional programming. Um, see me in the hallway to have a chat, and I, I'll take any questions if there are any.